And so they're taking those years away and they're taking ABCD grades away. They're taking kindergarten one, two, three through 12 away. And the whole thing is an open system where the child proceeds at his own pace and has his own test. He's not being compared against anybody else, no competition. Because he is the cog in the wheel. He's being trained for the state and the corporations, not for his own upward mobility. Forget classical education. That's what they're putting in right now. They're calling it Reinventing Schools Coalition. And Interestingly enough, why I should be living in this tall, small town of Dresden, Maine, where it's one of the pilots, one of the few in the country for it. I went over and I found out about it. Their whole goal was to turn education on its head into training, which is exactly what they wanted to do. Because if you take the Carnegie's little conclusions and recommendations for the social studies forget social studies okay I don't know why they call it that really it was really conclusions and recommendations for the destruction of American education that little book by putting that new system in and uh, the very people who signed off on their report were involved in in all of this at Columbia uh, George Counts, Rod, uh, Balu, you know, all the names. And, and so Carnegie, whereas you had uh, Hopkins and University of Chicago and all were putting in the method, Carnegie was advocating the change of our formerly free market system to a planned economy, Soviet style, through the schools. That's the little, black, little dark blue book conclusions and recommendations. That is recommending a new form of government and economic system for the United States and it clearly states in there the American people are going to have to get used to this because this is the new order that is, is uh, these barriers are breaking down all over the world we've got to have a world system and all you know this is all uh, I mean this isn't direct quotes but this is what the book tells you and that the curriculum has to be completely revised from the old classical curriculum to focus on world government, basically. That's that little 1934 book. So at the same time, you had uh, Columbia University and, and Dewey and all of them. Uh, Dewey, had, you know, a lot of them had been to the Soviet Union, George Counts. And they were just saying, this is the most wonderful system, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know... I think Counts recounted or recanted sort of at the end, you know, I think he realized because things were getting pretty brutal in the 30s under Stalin, huh? It was pretty hard to defend the system. But anyway, the goal, I think, people will always ask, well, why on earth did Wall Street finance the, Soviet, the Bolshevik Revolution? Why would they do that? Well, uh, I think they did it because... Russia was a very, I don't think they did it because they were uh, atheists or, or one thing or the other. I mean, William Boyce Thompson, he was head of the first head of the Federal Reserve, I think. He, he put 100,000 of his own money into Russia. I think it was all greed, personally. I think that's why they initially started supporting the Bolshevik Revolution. I think they wanted to be in control of the natural resources. I'm talking about uh, America's Secret Establishment by Anthony Sutton. I knew Anthony Sutton. Uh, we met, uh, we, we both were working on U.S. Soviet, ed Soviet uh, policy. I used to be in the State Department, so I was interested in that too. But one day, you know, he said, you know, I'm interested in uh, the influence of the order at Yale. And I said, oh, you, you are? And Interesting enough, I had just the day before received the copies of the membership in three or four little little books. There, uh, actually, we can take pictures of them if you want. I have them. And he said, "You have the membership list?" And I said, "Yes." And he asked me to send it to him, and I did. He promised he'd get them back, which he did. And he told me, he said, "Charlotte, I've been doing research for the Hoover Institute 
for several years on U.S. aid to the Soviet Union and wondering, what on earth are we doing? Why are we building up our enemy? I just can't, couldn't understand it. And he said, when I put all those names on the membership list that you had out on the dining room table, all of a sudden everything made sense. I saw the names of these very important people who were all involved in the defense contracts, who were involved in education going way back, everything. I saw what they were doing. And that was when he became, you know, even, he, he, really, he really started focusing. And he wrote the book after he got the list. And I've always really liked that. This is a really good quote here that I like to use because not just because the fellow that he's quoting was a friend of my father's, sort of interesting, uh, but because it's so, it tells you exactly how important the order of skull and bones at Yale is. People say, oh, it's a little boys club and they ignore it. They ignore the fact that John Kerry and George Bush were both running for president. Uh, you know, they didn't, I mean, isn't this sort of weird that out of a, an organization that has a maximum, I don't know how many, maybe 12,000 members that, or less, you know, since, since its creation, I don't know how many there are, that we would end up in a country of, what, uh, how many million are we? Uh, uh, having, having two people running for president who are for out of Yale, the order of skull and bones? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. So anyway, this is a quote uh, that he has. Uh, this is from F. O. Matheson who was Skull and Bones, 1923, uh, my father was too, uh, to Donald Ogden Stewart, Skull and Bones, 1916, an older guy. In regard to Matheson, they called him Maddie. Maddie's upcoming appearance before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. So he's writing to his other Skull and Bones buddy, you know, soothing his concerns and saying, don't, you know, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll make it. We're going to get by here. You know, we're going to get our agenda in, basically. So Matheson says, quote, as long as we have somebody from Bones, himself, right, who can bring pressure on the committee, I should think we'll be all right. So that's a very important quote. Now, Sutton goes on here and he says, for over 170 years, these people have met in secret. From out of their initiates come presidents, senators, judges, cabinet secretaries, and plenty of spooks, CIA. They are token titans of finance and industry, and they have just recently installed a third skull and bones president of the United States, George Jr., right? George W. Bush's secret name is temporary. <laughs> His father, George H.W. Bush's bones name is Magog, and his grandfather, Prescott Sheldon Bush, stole for the order one of their prized possessions, Geronimo's skull. But the order of skull and bones secrets have always been safe for the press of which much they owned. They owned, and that's why I think earlier you saw in this video, I mentioned that... Uh, or maybe I didn't. I have been writing letters to the press since 1975 that, with a direct quote from a communist that regionalism is communism. And I was, I've had other pu articles published, but they would never go near that. Either they would take that quote out, because that's a quote from a communist writer for the Daily World, writing for their own journal, the Daily World. And so when you talk about the control of the press, it's complete, the, the major media. I don't have to tell you folks that probably, but anyway. All right, no, Skull and Bones, uh, Bones Men, in, uh, is, here's a little list. Time, Life, Fortunes, Henry Luce. Newsweek's E. Roland Bunny Harriman, the Harriman, right? Uh, Cowles Communications, Alfred Cowles. National Review's William Buckley. Boy, he took us to the cleaners, didn't he? Atlantic Monthly's R.W. Davenport, I guess Buckley was the one that managed to get the, the conservatives in line, so they're supporting a planned economy and all, right? He said that he, he, he said that John Kenneth Galbraith was one of his best friends and he admired him, so, huh? Did uh, you repudiate the Birchers? Uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, went after the Birchers. He did terrible things, Buckley. Uh, Atlantic Monthly's Davenport, and among others. 
if the order uh, is mentioned in the establishment press at all, Bones is defined as just a staid wayside for students. Its glory faded. Uh, this book is extremely important. Uh, you can go on the internet to get it. You said Alex has got it, is that right? Uh, I think we you're right. Uh, Anthony Sutton was educated at the University of London, Gottingen, and California. While research fellow at the prestigious Hoover Institute, he produced the monumental three-volume series, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development. Other books include The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and Hitler, and many others. All right, this is a picture of my grandfather, Samuel Clifton Thompson, born in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And this is taken, this picture is taken just before he went out to South Africa as a mining engineer to open up the gold mines in South Africa. I might point out that he was uh, the first member in the family uh, from the Order of Skull and Bones. Uh, and uh, you'll be seeing later, you're going to see a picture of uh, Grandpa and my father is coming up. Put down a little bit. Okay. There you go. Right there. It's perfect. Thank you. And he lived out there from around 1897 and was there during the Boer War. And uh, they returned in 19, uh, the breakout of the first World War One. My father was born in South Africa, obviously. And uh, my grandfather met a lovely gal from South, from Australia. That was my grandmother, and uh, she she had come, this is a very interesting story. She had come over with her father and twelve siblings on a sailing ship from Australia to Cape Town. Uh, my great grandfather uh, from Australia uh, had emigrated from England and uh, was the clerk of the works or something in Melbourne, Australia, and they had all those children. And can you imagine? traveling on a sailing ship back in 1895 or something uh, with all those children. And anyway, my grandfather somehow met, we don't know how, my grandmother. And they were married in Johannesburg in 1902. And he was a member of the order at Yale and he was very close to Sir A. Bailey and some of the Fabian socialists. I don't really know I, what role he had in the activities of the order, but I would imagine some, because it was pretty big time gold mining and he was very instrumental in opening up the mines there. So that's Grandpa Thompson. Here is a picture of the same Grandpa a little bit later with my father and my sister, Victoria. And uh, that's Grandpa, he's uh, being very grandfatherly. This is probably around 19... 30, this picture. And that's my dad uh, holding on to my sister, my dad Clifton, who subsequently was tapped for the order in, uh, for his class at Yale. And uh, with Grandpa, uh, the one that I spoke to you about, uh, who was the mining engineer that went from Pennsylvania to South Africa to open the gold mines in the late 1800s. This is an interesting picture here, which shows, um, I think that this, this, is the whole, this looks like a bunch of skull and bones, friends. I do believe. I'm going to show you the picture and then I will identify a bit for you. Uh, the one in the front row um, is Charles Bofford. Uh, and then we have my father, I'll explain a little bit, it's difficult to hold this up, but the, the one in the front row in the middle is Charles Spofford, uh, a very close friend of my father's, and I, I really like Charles Spofford a lot. He ended up being uh, the legal counsel from Davis Polk, Wardwell, Sunderland, Kendall, to, for the Suez Canal Company, and many, many other uh, high, high positions. He rose to the top, getting all sorts of honorary medals from foreign governments in Europe and everywhere and uh, Council on Foreign Relations and uh, a lawyer and a very, very decent, nice man. He was close to my father. Uh, he died about 25 years ago, I guess.